Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Nerd Tween and a Movie Podcast. I am your host, Nerdpool Prime. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, so today we're going to be doing a mid-season low-key episode recap slash spec slash um, review. It's not going to really be a scene-for-scene scene breakdown that I am known for where I just go into literally every single scene. I'm going to pick out certain scenes that I feel we need to talk about, uh, but I'm definitely not going to do the full deep, deep, deep dive like I usually do because I'm be honest with you, I, I don't have the time. Um, I just did an interview uh, last night, uh, technically this morning. Um, it was at 4 a.m., uh, yeah, 4 a.m. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a, it's, it's been a long uh, 48 hours. The last two weekends, I've been really going really as as the kids would say, hard in the paint, um, and, and pulling double duty with working full time and doing uh, interviews or uh, whatnot shows. Um, I, speaking of, I have a whatnot show uh, today. Uh, this episode will drop at 11 a.m. Uh, I have a uh, show at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the WhatNot app. Just search Nerd Tween, um, or you can go onto any one of my um, Instagram pages. There's a link in there for uh, three dollars off uh, for your first purchase. So go check that out if you can. If not, um, I digress. So uh, Loki, we're gonna start with a little breakdown, a little thoughts about episode two. Uh, episode two called the Variant. So I'm not sure if anyone else has stumbled upon this uh, yet, but I, f I think I figured out what the significance about the dates that the variant was attacking is. I figured it out. You want to know what it was? Nothing. And this isn't like one of those like false answers like in um, Star Wars when uh, Kylo Ren said your, your, uh, your parents were nobodies. What I mean by that is there was nothing that was supposed to happen at those times. Like they're very, like think about it. There was in the middle of the night in a, in an oil field. There was in a empty church. What looks like an empty church, maybe one kid in the church, um, and or like the Renaissance fair when someone who was not dressed in the Renaissance fair uh, attire was there. It was to purposely grab the TVA's attention because. Places like that, the the variance energy would would alert them far sooner than if it was in, in in a more important time. You know what I mean? So that's just a thought that I had, um, and, and I must say I, I felt that that woman at the beginning of the episode when the TVA shows up and was like, "You guys aren't dressed right," and like as they walked away, like some of us need this. I I think many of us. Um, who, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm sure this probably has happened to you. Uh, we've had that feeling at least once or twice in our lives as a nerd. Uh, but moving on, I, and I, let's let's talk about how awesome that fight was uh, with the 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 music from uh, bon Bonnie Tyler's uh, "Holding Out for a Hero" as a C20 played by Sasha Lane, uh, who you might know from the recent uh, reboot of from Hellboy. It showed this the the skill level. Uh, between Hunter versus a regular Minutemen person. Uh, like, like she took out, what, four of them by herself without even trying, really? Like, she didn't even use her, her time staff or time wand, whatever you want to call it. She used, like, uh, uh, a, a jousting stick <laughs> and just her abilities. So, what the hell is going on with Miss Minutes? I mean, Lo Loki even asked the question, are you alive or recording? And she responds, I'm sorry to both. Like, what the hell? I mean, like, she did the same thing in, in the first episode, too, when Loki was, like, literally just screamed, this is a mistake, I'm not supposed to be here. Hello there. You're probably saying this is a mistake and I shouldn't be here. Like, what? what is that? There's no magic. So what is that, like, super advanced technology? I don't know. We'll see. Now, when Mobius gives Loki that jacket, did you notice that it was wrapped in, like, cellophane? Uh, which would lead it to assume that it was, like, a mass-produced thing. Which would lead, uh, that the, the continuation of that thought would be that the TVA often employs variants. Wink, wink. More on that statement later. Uh, Professor Loki and his perfect explanation of what the difference between illusion projection um, and what he does so much, especially to Thor, 
duplication casting, which was just pure Loki. And that, that was just another like another example of how great uh, Tom Hiddleston is in this role. He, he, he was def- – like, people talk about perfect casting and all this stuff. That's perfect casting. So also, think about this. Uh, throughout the episode, when people grill him about information, he always seems to have the answer. Even the TVA stuff. He, he couldn't have had that information too long, like, to, like, really, like, research and, and like, memorize it. So – that would lead me to believe that Loki either has a photographic memory or an eidetic memory, like Sheldon Cooper does on From the Big Bang Theory. But moving on. Uh, also think about how at every single turn, Mobius seems to know what Loki is, quote-unquote, scheming. Even when Loki thinks he has uh, the, the, the he's 10 steps ahead of him, Mobius seems to always know. It's like he knows Loki better than he knows himself. Like, even in the 10, uh, after C-20's abduction, he... Was able to like, all right, keep talking, keep talking. Okay, he's lying. Move on. And, or, or, or like, anytime Loki like says, "Oh, I'm ahead of you," Mobius literally tells his secret plan. He's like, and he even called him out on. It. He's like, well, the history's greatest liar. Like, you expect that to happen. And also, did you notice in this episode how many times they use the word he or him when talking about the fugitive variant? They didn't do that so much in the first couple episodes. They just kept saying the variant or the fugitive variant. This time, they literally were saying he, him, his. So that was obvious foreshadowing for me. I mean, we all kind of knew that like Lady Loki was going to show up. Oh, spoiler alert. Sorry. You know, this this episode is now a week old, so I'm not even going to like get into any spoiler stuff. But I do the 48-hour spoiler ban, and by the time this episode airs, it's been well over 48 hours. So um, if you are listening to this, I apologize. But you clicked on an episode that says that it was Loki uh, mid-season wrap-up or whatever I title it. It was definitely clear that uh, you'll get stuff like this if you listen to this episode. But I'll put spoiler warnings in the in the the, <laughs> the description so they can't get mad at me. Uh, but moving on. We also finally get to see what the reset charge does, and it was really beautiful. It literally, like, almost like it washed over the the timeline um, and, and just deleted everything that wasn't supposed to be there. It, it, it Again, it reminded me of that ego, um, uh, like, seed thing he put in. It just, in the ground, it just covers everything. Now, it was obviously different, but... It helps connect my theory that it's a celestial energy. Um, so, and of course, ego is a celestial. So that would make sense. Uh, th- there's, there's a uh, so now the scene where uh, Mobius talks to uh, Renslayer. There's a lot to talk about here. So first thing, when Mobius like gets his drink and he puts it down, there are multiple rings um, on, on on the the end table, whatever you want to call it. And then Renslayer basically like. And motion him to get a, a, a coaster. Now, judging from what we learn later in episode three, I would bet those rings are all the fault of Mobius. Or at least a Mobius. More on that later. Now, when Renslayer is talking about Loki, she says he's an evil lying scourge. When Mobius says, well, is it possible for him to switch up or maybe make a change? And Ren- Renslayer immediately hits him with the only if the timekeepers decree it. Now, Mobius said he has never met the timekeepers. Hold on. Actually, no, for, let me back up for a second. Renslayer said, you know, that only the timekeepers decree it. Well, he's not on the sacred timeline. So this variant of Loki, as he even said in, um, was it this episode? Yeah, later in the episode that him and um, Mobius are the only ones that are free. So legitimately speaking this loki could absolutely change because he's not on the sacred timeline so the 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 time while the timekeepers may have authority in the tva they have authority over at least how they're making it out to be the authority over the sacred timeline and he's not on it so but moving on uh so mobius you know asked how the timekeepers are doing it and he said well i never met him but he does like kind of motion towards the one in the like the the main one that we keep seeing the one that's always been in the middle uh which kind of looks like Kang the Conqueror and he says like well that's not just well that one and then he gets cut off by Renslayer 
So I, I think if that's another nod that we might possibly get Kang to show up a lot sooner than Ant-Man 3. Um, and I, I've, I've even postulated that he might even show up in this series. I felt like his casting was way too early on um, for it to be just for Ant-Man. But more on that <laughs> and, and as that story develops. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, again, the the interaction and the acting abilities of both Owen Wilson and Tom Hiddleston are just on just pure, just masterful level. Uh, like when Loki is trying to explain himself after he, like, tried to, you know, sabotage the, the first mission they went on. Moby just kind of ignores him until he just tells him, shut up. <laughs> like, and, and it goes on this little rant, and, and he literally puts him in, the, in his place, uh, Loki in his place, with one of the most savage takedowns when he was questioned about his motives, he says, A, he says, what are your motives? A, because I see a scared little boy shivering in the cold who kind of kind of feel bad for that ice runt. Or B, I just won't want to catch this guy and I'll tell you whatever I need to tell you. Savage. <laughs> Mobius has, has uh, Loki looking over the files of the attacks and he gets shushed by uh, one of the TVA employees. And I don't give a crap who you are. Nobody shushes Loki. Loki does the shushing. He's like the Eisenberg of shushing. He is the one who does the shushing. <laughs> uh, moving on. So he tries to get files on the timekeepers, and of course he can't do that. Start, end of time, obviously won't let him do that. So he gets his own files. Uh, so going over his file, he sees the destruction of Asgard. And you can even see, like, oh, man, the 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 just ability of Tom Hiddleston to make a tear swell. Like, I, I, I've i done some acting. I've, I've been in plays in college, and I, I hope to eventually do more acting, and especially voice acting in the future. Uh, but it's not easy to, one, make yourself cry in most situations, but to make yourself cry like that. It's just impressive. Like, it's absolutely, like, just mind-bogglingly impressive uh, that he was able to do that. And so, like, when he's looking down, he sees how many people died. And then, you know, the music comes in. I'll talk about how, how much the music was amazing in this show so far as well later. But it starts, you know, pulling at your heartstrings without that violin. And then shifts into, like, this hero's call to action when Loki figures out that there is zero variance energy that could be detected during an apocalypse. And we know when he goes to explain this theory to Mobius, you know, it, he he could have explained it in so many different ways, but he had to take Mobius' salad and destroy it. And you can see it, he, he was enjoying every minute of it. And Mobius was just like, he just did it just to mess with Mobius. And Hiddleston and, and Wilson were just absolutely brilliant in that, in that scene. Um, Especially coming down to that satisfied, like, ha, 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 I destroyed your salad smile that Hiddleston gave at the end. Uh, it's, they just play so well off each other, as I'll get to later in, in this episode about the next episode and more interaction with Tom Hiddleston and pretty much anyone he comes into contact with on screen. Um, moving on. So I loved how Loki was like, I would never stab a person in the back. Such a cowardly form of betrayal. Mo Mobius had, like, he literally had to call him out. Was like, okay, so I've studied your whole life, and you've literally done that like 50 times. Like, an absolute hilarious scene. Uh, just commit, just, just using comedy to water down what was basically a giant exposition scene and make it enjoyable. So you actually wanted to hear them talk about what, like, will set up the, what's setting up the rest of the episode there, you know? And, when you can deliver exposition without delivering exposition by having it flow in the story, it, it makes it for a much more enjoyable um, watching experience, in my opinion. And then, you know, they of course, they go to test the theory in Pompeii. Uh, and I love when Loki just started yelling in Italian, telling everyone they're doomed. And I, you can tell that Hiddleston just had so much fun shooting that scene it was literally plastered all over his face just like the absolute joy even to like the hair flip like it, he's just like it just seemed like he was just having a blast and that's one good for the character because that's what loki would have he would have enjoyed that too but to see that tom hiddleston enjoyed it as well made it 
made it that much more enjoyable. I I keep saying that this this show is is amazing, and I have been saying for a while since even before um, WandaVision came out that I was excited for all of them, and I'm sure they were all going to be good. But I kept saying that I think Loki is going to be the best one, and halfway point of the season. So far, it looks like I may be right about that. Um, let's see. Where was I? Okay, yeah. While uh, they're trying to figure out which apocalypse the the Varen is hiding in, Loki takes a nap while Mobius is still researching. Remember that for later because I'll come back to that uh, when I get to stuff about in the third episode. I want to try to keep it at least a little, you know, lined up. Loki and Mobius have a conversation about jet skis. Um, and... More on that later as well. Um, and you know what? I'm going to pull a Ted Mosby. You know what? I'm not going to get to that later. So the jet skis, I, I, I feel like they're at some point in time, Mobius was definitely on a jet ski and it's somehow like it is coming through his TVA programming. So I'm just going to leave it at that. That might make sense a little more later. <laughs> um, so once they figure out where the Varen is hiding, thanks to the clue from that boy in the first episode, and I honestly, and I, I'm probably wrong, uh, and I have no problem admitting that if I am, but I just got this weird feeling that's Kid Loki. And I think Kid Loki is trying to, like, I think Kid Loki is the balancing of the equation with this lady Loki trying to, to destroy or, or sabotage TVA, and Kid Loki is trying to balance that out. I, I don't know. I, that, that, I just got this weird feeling. I hope I, I would love to be right on that. But, you know, if I am, I called it first. I'm just saying. I had dibs on that theory. Uh, um, one thing to point out uh, about the variant's hiding spot was is the, the company Rock's cart. Now, if you ask me and a lot of other people that do um, things like this, believe that it's a, rep, uh, uh, a reference to Roxxon. Uh, which is a really big um, thing in the comics. It did show up in the Netflix Daredevil series, uh, by the way, hashtag save Daredevil. Uh, and there's a new rumor, um, Nerd Sweet News here, uh, that Charlie Cox Daredevil will show up in the Disney Plus Hawkeye series. So, so far we have a quote-unquote confirmed, not by Marvel, by uh, uh, very reputable sources, that Charlie Cox is in uh, Spider-Man... Uh, no way home and then now rumors that he shows up in disney's hawkeye series honestly th that would be a great move on uh disney's part and it would be like almost an extra like backhand to like what dc and warner brothers are doing with like messing up everything continuously um to have that uh be like fans demanded you save daredevil and, and disney was like okay <laughs> like, where fans are like, we want the Snyder Cut, and Warner Brothers is like, mm, yeah, I don't think so. No, no, not do it. <laughs> like, uh, and and not to throw any shade, which I do, I guess, is to throw shade, but we're, we're talking about Loki. Moving on. Um, but like I said, in the comics, uh, Roxxon first appeared in Captain America 180 all the way back in December of 1974, and is one of the more evil... Um, and well-known companies in the Marvel comics, um, and even at times rivals the companies like Oscorp. They are a big feature in the 2099 storylines, and if the live-action Spider-Verse is going to really happen, then I would love, would love to see Miguel O'Hara make his way to the MCU. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, but moving on, the Loki variant has shown the ability to possess people uh, with enchantment, and they use it to perfection to have an entire conversation with our Loki while setting up her plan. Did I reveal it was a her yet? <laughs> oh, well, like I said, you got, you, you, this is a week old. I'm, I, I, I'm sorry. Not sorry. Um, it is revealed about the variant. Oh, look, I was literally the very, <laughs> the very next line. Um, it is revealed that the variant is a woman. Now this character is definitely more of an amalgamation of uh, two Marvel Comics characters, like Lady Loki and Sylvie Lushton, um, a character who would take on the role of Enchantress. Uh, I, I thought that maybe she was not actually Loki, but using magic to appear as Loki to the TVA. Uh, but the promos that I've seen from Episode Four uh, all but kill that theory. So I'm not going to talk about those uh, 
episode four um, promos. Then, then these are the ones that were released by Marvel. So it's not even like it's a leak. So you can definitely find them online because they won't, you know, copyright strike themselves. So tell me why the moment when he realized how tedious it was to talk to a Loki, he <laughs> Now I understand why Thor found this so annoying. Like, he just knew, like, yep, I, the, you know, it makes sense. He's just trying to help, and then she's like, yeah, no, screw you. <laughs> so when Lady Loki enacts her plan, she literally bombs the sacred timeline, uh, creating what appeared to be infinite branches and timelines. And if you looked at, like, I didn't get a chance to break down every single one that was on there, because there's a lot of them, but there were places like um, Asgard was there, uh, uh, Vormir was there, um... Uh, the, the planet with um, the Nova Corps. I, I, I'm drawing a blank because I didn't write this down, to, to be honest, um, in the script. Uh, but, and, the, and, the, and like New York, Hong Kong, where the Sanctum Sanctorums would be. Um, the different Sanctums, I guess. Sorry, I think the Sanctorum is, is just the one in New York, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it literally bombed like all significant points in the timeline, creating infinite timelines branching out and not... Literally, the way they've explained, like, when Loki was talking with Ms. Minutes about what would happen if they um, they can't, like, stop a, a variant event, uh, a, sorry, Nexus event, it will just spiral out of control. So it looks like there was, like, literally, oh, like, infinite ones spiraling out of control and in what would assume to be infinite different directions. Oh, man, the, the implications of how many different things could happen. I mean, like, really, like, this show could absolutely just have anyone appear like they, they could literally this what she did could literally broken reality and they they now have freaking like a, a different tony stark I, I know that's probably like what people are expecting from uh dr strange 2 in the multiverse of madness um which very well might happen but like this this is i think is what's really kicking it off and i think this is a jumping off point for um, Spider-Man No Way Home as well by the time the end of it is. But uh, moving on. So Lo Lady Loki escapes uh, through a time door um, with Mobius hot in pursuit. Uh, Loki just initially hesitates there for a second. And I love that, like, the red color, like the stop, like where he was just frozen there for a second, deciding if he was going to wait and not go after her or if he was going to go after her. Um and the episode ends with, like, the, like this, like, moment where Mobius can't catch up to me. Just, like, I really wish, like, they could have put, like, a, a bad word, like, right there. Like, the F word right there would have been amazing. Um, but it, uh, obviously, it's on a Disney Plus show, so it's not going to happen. But uh, I really do love how each episode ends with a cliffhanger. Um, and the next episode literally picks it up right where uh, that one left off. So, that being said, now we're, let's move into episode three, Lamentus. Uh, now, before I even say one word about this episode, let me let me take a drink for this because this might go off the rails. I didn't write any curse words in here, but I have a feeling I might go um, NSFW, not safe for work, um, about what I'm about to say. So give me a second. Okay. I need to talk about an issue that I've heard regarding this episode. So, like I said, this may not be safe for work. So, if you're at work, you got this on the speaker, do me a favor, put some headphones in or, or pause in, go somewhere or something. Because I, I can't guarantee I'm not going to go off on this. Um, and I can already feel people like, ooh, how's this going to play out? So, this is my stance. If you have a problem with the fact that Loki is now confirmed bisexual, then you are ignorant on multiple levels. First of which, it's Pride Month. Think about that. It's Pride Month. So even if you had these wrong opinions, keep that shit to your damn self. T show some common decency and at least keep it to yourself. You should go literally think about why that pissed you, why you get so upset over things like that that have nothing to do with you in the first place. Maybe go seek some counseling or something along those lines, but that's not what I'm talking about. If you, for whatever reason, have to harbor those angers. Keep that shit to your damn self. At the very least, at the end of this damn month. Like, seriously. Now, second. It has been heavily rumored anyway in the MCU. And the fact that Loki is gender fluid according to the TVA records. It would, you know, there's a logical connection to the fact that maybe 
the sexual preferences may work in a similar fashion and be fluid. Hmm, that makes sense. Ah. Oh. But finally, did you know that the original North mythology Loki turned himself into a female horse and did the nasty with another horse, got pregnant, and birthed an eight-legged horse named Slipnir. Slipnir. I probably, I, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. And guess what? That horse already appeared in the MCU. So yeah, as long as we don't see um, that happening, I'm pretty sure you don't have anything to complain about. Because I'll admit, let me tell you what, if we somehow see in the MCU Loki giving birth to an eight-legged horse, yeah, I'm going to complain. And you can complain too. But guess what? If you're upset because Loki is bisexual, what the fuck's your problem? What does it matter to you? Like, seriously, is that going to make you not like the character because now you know he's bisexual? Think about it. You've liked the character all the way up to this point. The character's been bisexual the whole time. It just wasn't imp It wasn't something that was broadcast. And now that it is, you got a problem? You might want to look at yourself in the mirror. That's all I got to say. So, with that out the way, moving on. Sylvie, as she's like to be called, um, is an absolute badass. She's taken out a whole crew of Minutemen with ease. And now one thing I want to say is, did you notice that when she tried to use her magic, um, it seemed to start to work only to like only to have a little spark. When Loki tried to use his magic, it literally did nothing. Now, maybe that is because of the time collar or, you know, or something like that. But still, it seems her her magic is different um at least at least it was able to manifest for a moment before it it eventually fizzled out i did like though when when she beat up the uh the last one she just laid dropped the time staff like drop mic drop uh when when finally we finally oh thank god we finally got to see loki use his signature daggers uh when loki and sylvie fought they seemed to be very evenly matched in skill and tactics even ending uh the fight when they were like when renslayer uh, comes up in that comical like pause punch uh bef before they escape to lamentus one now here's some spec that i have i've come up with from the that from that term mentioned above in the comics, Lamentis is, lo is located in the Kree Empire, and it first appeared in the Annihilation Conquest prologue at number one in 2007, which is a big storyline in the comics. Uh, so I'm thinking that we could possibly see the villain race called the Phalanx. Uh, Phalanx have deep ties with the X-Men in the comics, and we know they're they're coming to the MCU in the future. Uh, that could be a nice way to introduce fan favorites like Nova if uh, he has not already been introduced already by um, another property. Uh, moving on, uh, Hiddleston somehow has ridiculous on-screen chemistry with every single person that is in a scene with him. Um, and the, the interactions just seem to be not only genuine to the character, but to Tom as a person from what we know of him. And, and I said Tom like I know the guy. Um, as well as being incredibly entertaining. Like every single moment that... Sophie, Sophia DiMartino and Hiddleston have on screen is just absolute gold. Like their interactions, it, it literally is like that. I mean, so technically, these are two versions of the same person arguing with each other, and which is kind of interesting because in the comics in the Secret Wars event, Tony Stark argues with Tony Stark. So like that, it's it's actually kind of like an interesting little parallel. So this episode had some really great cinematography with the use of bisexual lighting all throughout. The harmonious blend of pinks, purples, and blues was the perfect lighting for this episode in which, of course, Loki has been confirmed not to be bisexual. And I have already said my piece on that earlier. And honestly, I um, apologize if uh, anything I said offended you. Um, it wasn't meant to. Well, I guess to certain people it was meant to. And if you were the one who got offended, that's your fault, your problem. Um, I have no problem losing you as a, as a listener if, if you really have a problem with Loki being bisexual. Just saying. Um, moving on. Um, 
Sylvie says that she cannot sleep in a place like this. And Loki responds, what's on a train? So when she responds with no, surrounded by people I don't trust, it, it made me call back. And this is what I was talking about earlier. I, I feel like Loki um, sleeping around Mobius means he 100 actually does trust Mobius, which is something that Loki doesn't do with many people. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, little bit of sprinkle of knowledge they put in there or world building, I guess uh, when Loki is talking about his mother, you can see Sylvie almost had a looky look of longing. Um, you can tell that Loki like wears this mask of a heartless villain, but he genuinely loved his mother, even if she wasn't his biological uh, parent. So what is love? What's love got to do, got to do with it? Um, did you for once think that you that a major uh, thread of a Loki episode would be what's love? I know I sure as hell didn't. But I have to admit, I loved it. Pun totally intended. Uh, so we have love is mischief. Um, maybe. But I think the one that I liked the most was Love is a dagger. And speaking for myself, I, when, the way Loki explained it, uh, man, let me tell you, that it way too close to home. He said it's a weapon to be wielded from far or up close. You can see yourself in it. It's beautiful. It makes you bleed until it makes you bleed. But ultimately, when you reach for it, it isn't real. So love is an imaginary dagger. Hmm. Well, let me tell you, from personal experience... When that when that cuts, that shit sure feels real. Just saying. We also have another great moment um, to to go along with our dancing Zemo. Um, and what was in the what was in Wandavision that was like that? I I'm trying to think. I wonder what it was. Um, but there was definitely something in that one that was really funny too. But um, I'm drawing a blank. But moving on. Uh, yeah, the. When Loki was singing that Asgardian song, it was just truly lovely. I, 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 man, it was it was just hilarious watching him, <laughs> watching him sing and dance and act all drunk. I think he was acting drunk, by the way, too. Just to throw that out there, I know he's not Asgardian. He's an, uh, but he's a, is a frost giant, so I feel like he probably um, would be able to hold his liquor pretty well. And we do get a nice little callback to a great Asgardian tradition um, of enjoying a tasty beverage, screaming another and smashing the glass on the ground. Thor would be proud. Uh, Loki and Sylvie battle the guards uh, of that train. Loki shows off some new like energy uh, spells that we've not seen before besides in the trailers. Uh, so that's an interesting new um, weapon in his uh, quiver of magic that we've never seen. Um, Sylvie used her crown, her Loki crown as a weapon. And it appears that she kind of just left it. Uh, so I feel like that was a representation of her leaving the Loki, uh, moniker behind. Uh, she's no longer Loki at all. She's Sylvie. And I think by the end of the show, she's either going to be called Enchantress or she's going to be like, no, you can call me Enchantress. Like, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that's what we're going to get by end of this, the, the episode, the end of the se season, just kind of like we got with, um, us agent and, um, uh, Scarlet, Witch in, in Disney plus, which does kind of point out a recurring trend of the similar, um, build of these series, but Hey, it's working, um, at least for now. So I don't see a reason to really fix it. Um, we also learn that the TVA employees were not created by the timekeepers. Like they believe, but they are also variants themselves. So back to that thought about Mobius, when he was talking to Renslayer, maybe there are numerous variants of Mobius and Mobius deployed all across the timelines, um, the sacred timeline. Um, and that's basically who makes up the um, analysts of the TVA. I would love to see Owen Wilson talking to Owen Wilson. It would be such a wow moment. Uh, the director did say that Owen Wilson is not going to say the signature catchphrase on the show. Um, but I do think that leaves the door open for him to say it in like a post credit scene. Because technically that's not part of the show. You know what I mean? It's a post credit. It's not part of the episode. Technically. 
So I think that would be a way to get around it. If they, if he does end up saying it, it might be in a post credit scene. So that, that mad dash, the shuttle, that whole sequence was just, um, absolutely a visual spectacle. A, a, I, I can't even think of a better like a, a word to describe it. The way they were moving and changing the direction and the camera angles and the you know the 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 the, the graphics, the explosions and everything. Just the it, it really grasped what like it made you feel that chaotic um, feeling that you would if you were in that situation by constantly adjusting your eye line and then everything like that. That's a, that's a great. Another great cinematography trick to it, it's in, it's done to make the audience feel disoriented as well as getting the entire um, view of everything going on at different points. So that's definitely um, very very great to see. Now I I, I gotta say this I, I usually can you know whether or not it, it, it's good enough or accurate I can usually come up with some kind of explanation for things that happen in these shows, but I, I have no idea what happened with that building that almost fell on Loki and Sylvie. Loki just turned and stopped it, and it went and just literally re reversed its trajectory. Now, the only thing I can come up with is that Loki stole a time stone uh, before he went to chase down Sylvie in the TVA. Uh, th that's the only thing I can think of. Because um, I... Again, unless unless Loki has more magic that we've never seen before, which is very, 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 very possible. So who knows at this point? So I, I, I think so far at the halfway point of the show, I, I really couldn't be happier. Uh, seriously, with all the great scenes, uh, individual scenes that build the whole story, but there are some truly awesome little bits uh, that were run in these episodes. Uh, it, it was truly... Uh, a great thing to to watch so far uh, you, you throw in the amazing acting that i mentioned um before uh then you can you, you also have to put into consideration the fantastic music um because they had a great mix of like the original score um accentuating let's try that again accentuating certain scenes as well as perfectly chosen needle drops um at certain scenes like i, I talked about earlier with the uh that, that battle in the tent where they, they had that um, the song playing and it just fit perfectly. Um, and I mean, damn, man, they, they laid out the groundwork for the Secret Wars. Like, how could you be upset about that? I, I You know, I've been talking about this show for a while. I, I always said it was going to be the best of the original of the first wave of Disney Plus shows, um, which is saying a lot because WandaVision, as anyone who listens to my podcast knows, how much I loved WandaVision um, and Falcon and the Winter Soldier as well was absolutely phenomenal. But I, I kept saying, man, I think Loki's going to be the best. And so far, halfway through, it looks like I might be right. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing how this uh, wraps up. Uh, Tom Hiddleston was quoted as saying that his favorite episode uh, was episode five. So we're two weeks away from his favorite episode, which is the one before the season finale. So I uh, look to, to have something really awesome happen in the next few weeks here. Uh, so what I would suggest is you, you know, do all that uh, liking and sharing and subscribing so you can tune in next week for another breakdown. Um, and that's really my, my Loki so far. Um, I just absolutely love it. I'm going to do everyone's doing these star ratings or one out of 10. So I'm, let's, let's do that. I'm going to try this. This is the first time I've ever done it. One out of 10 is the worst. 10 out of 10 is the best. I'm going to say right now at the halfway point, it's an 8.5 out of 10 uh, because it, it's been amazing. Uh, I just have n no issues, but I feel like there's certain things that could have been uh, done a little better if they were willing to, to take – even more chances than they already have. Um, and that's not, to be honest, I, I don't think many things are 10 out of 10. Like, you want to know, like, an individual episode could be 10 out of 10, but a whole series to be, a whole season to be 10 out of 10, it's going to be really hard to do that. Um, and so far, with the world building they had to do in the first couple episodes, and now the the great acting, action and acting we've got, 
um, at the halfway point and hell secret wars being set up it looks like yeah I, i'm gonna go 8.5 out of 10 and and that's just being modest really um yeah that's that i'll, I'll go 8.5 out of 10 but that's all i have for um the loki talk this week but i do want to say um you're definitely going to want to go on to my YouTube channel if you're listening to this on your um, podcast apps because uh, I did do an interview with an amazing comic book artist, the one responsible for the High Republic Marvel Comics, Ario Anandito. Uh, that's up on my YouTube right now. And next week, I'm going to be interviewing the Illis Umanati, uh, who is another fantastic uh, comic book artist. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to eventually to try to get a Black Summer Season 2 review done uh, one of these days. Uh, I'll be doing a season wrap-up uh, and review of The Bad Batch because while I am caught up on the show as in watching it, I have not been bringing it uh, to the podcast as much as I would like to. Also, like I said, if you only listen to my show on po- on the podcast apps like Spotify or iHeartRadio or Amazon Music or whatever you listen to, you are, you're missing out on three great interviews that are only up on the YouTube channel right now. Um Noah uh, with Noah from uh, Noah's Amazing Reviews, Chancellor from Whatnot Comics, and as I mentioned moments ago, Ario Anandito. And let me say, I have him on record saying that Marvel should hashtag make Wolverine short again for inclusion purposes. Hey, yeah. Um, and I'm going to be honest, I'll, I'll be working on getting those uploaded to the podcast apps as well. Um, but in, in the meantime, you can always check out the YouTube channel uh, and... I just want to say thanks for joining me um, on another episode of Nerd Tween and Movie Podcast. This is your host, Nerdpool Prime, signing off. Do me a favor and like and subscribe and do all of that social media jazz. <laughs> this is the Cloud Prince of Crime. Until next time, kitties! <laughs>